Moving on from a straight line, we can move on to these things called circular arcs. Um, it's just a different shape, but the basic idea is still very much the same. We find out the overall electric field by looking at the integrating little bits of electric field by saying each little bit is k dq over r square in the r hat direction. So usually our jobs is set up, what is this thing and what are these things? In this case, of course, uh, it's no longer a simple 1D problem. It's got 2D, which is why more reason to be really good at this unit vector stuff. And the other piece here is because the circular arc, we have to know a little something about how DQ is related to the overall Q. And that has to do with, um, if you remember, arc length. Because the way we're cutting this line up, we're going to cut up this way. And so we have to work out, first of all, what is this overall length? Big L. And what is the length of a little chunk, little L? So an arc length, you can just think of as a part of a circumference. We call that distance S. And then if we call that phi, because theta is used up already, given a certain radius, you can find out that the arc length is basically the circumference, which is 2 pi r. And then how much of the angle did you have? If you use radians, and everything's going to out, work out pretty nicely. Because the full circle is 2 pi radians. And then you have however much chunk of that. So that simplifies quite a bit, which ends up with r phi, where phi is in radian. That's very, very key. Which is all as well, because we're going to be using calculus now, so and radians is going to be the natural unit in terms of deriving and integrating sines and cosines. So in our case, we have the overall L, which is R times, how big is this angle? Well, this angle is not just theta, it's 2 theta. And then DL is going to be R times D, and let's use alpha. We're kind of running out of Greek letters here, where D alpha is this little angle right there. So that will help us define our dq being the overall charge divided by the length times low dl. So that's r2 theta, r d alpha, r goes away. So we have q over 2 theta d alpha. That gives us a hint that we're going to be integrating against this variable called alpha. So let's go and define all that. But before that, uh, I'd like to point out that we can save ourselves some work in these kind of types of problem in many, many cases, using the idea of symmetry. So in this case, what is the symmetry we're talking about? Well, if you look at this somewhat intensely, you can kind of picture that right down the middle, there's an axis of symmetry. For every single point, let's call this DL1. We'll get a DE1 like that. And then there's a corresponding point on this side, call that DL2, they'll give you an electric field like that, where, because the magnitude is all the same, because all these radius is constant, and that's why we like to do circular arc a lot, the x component here, they always cancel out. So the symmetry allows us to say that all the de in the x direction cancels. So we really only have to keep the dey. So that will save us some work a little bit down the road. But we still have to set up the entire thing because, as you remember from before, even with point charges, because of the R underneath, you still need to know the overall vector before you can get rid of X or Y within the unit vector part. Oh, silly me. Of course, Y, Y, we mean that's our Y and that's our X. But we have to now define what alpha is because we, of course, have to integrate against alpha, whatever this is. We'll also define alpha in a way that is symmetric around the same thing. So it's not y to say to call this alpha equals zero and then go positive alpha like that. Rather, it's actually better to say along this line, alpha is equal to zero right down the middle. And we're going to define positive in that way. And then if we go here in these points, then alpha would be less than zero. So we have some positive and some negative, and then everything should cancel out. And because we have some positive or negative alpha, it's good to check both sides and make sure that the expression is consistent. So keeping this charge thing in mind, we fill out the displacement vector and the unit vector, and then we will be in business. So we will keep continue considering 
one over here and two over here just so that you have a case for alpha bigger than zero as well as a case of alpha less than zero in a little bit so r1 to p is equal to rp minus r1 and the way we've defined it p is at zero zero so we have zero zero minus r1 you can use sine and cosine where in this case alpha for alpha one will be like that positive you that's a y component that's the x component so you can use sine and cosine x component is r sine alpha plus r cosine alpha both positive alpha being positive both of these are getting positive everything checks out i and j then we expand the negative sign which makes sense because the vector again goes from the source to the point which is why we're going to get negative r sine we get that the magnitude surprise surprise you will get r in case you need a double check you i remind you that sine square plus cosine square which is the i and j square has a identity equal to one so the sine and cosine they all go away during the calculation so it's just r which makes sense because for the circular arc every single point has the exact same magnitude of the displacement then for the r hats we just divide r through everything so we're left with sine alpha in the i hat plus negative cosine alpha in the j hat and just check we can set up the same thing for alpha less than zero in case number two this guy up here in which case alpha is measured here but it's going to be a negative number because it's to the left of where alpha equals to zero so r2p follows the exact same way r2 here is it's still positive sine alpha i plus cosine alpha j you might be saying now what the heck's happening because clearly that point should have a positional vector that is in the negative x right but don't forget that alpha here is less than zero so if alpha is equal to zero sine alpha is also less than zero so the negative sign is actually hidden in that part whereas the cosine even though the alpha is less than zero a cosine function looks like this so for between zero and 90 cosine alpha is still greater than zero so this side is still positive which is what we expect positive y negative x and the negative again is because alpha is less than zero here so then there's a negative sign which is great because that tells us that for both alpha greater than zero and alpha less than zero we have the exact same expression so then we can just treat that everything as as a simple same de dq as we mentioned was q divided by two theta d alpha and then my r is big r all square unit vector being minus sine alpha in the i plus minus cosine alpha in the j and this is where the symmetry cuts down on our work instead of doing both x and y all we have to say is the overall electric field it's equal to just the y part of everything because again of symmetry so we just have to sum up just the y part basically what we're doing is we're dropping the i hat or the x component due to the symmetry and the last thing is deciding what our start and stop is back at the diagram we want this line all the way to that line which means alpha is negative theta to positive theta negative theta positive theta and there we've set up the integral so now we can just use math and integrate this one is also not very hard so we can do it fairly quickly the expression may look somewhat lengthy but keep in mind that the only thing that is varying here is alpha so anything that does not involve alpha we can factor out so k comes out q comes out we have the negative coming out including the two theta underneath that is all constants doesn't depend on alpha r doesn't depend on alpha and so what we have left is just cosine oh and the j hat also comes out cosine alpha 
the alpha. Ain't that simple? And this integral is so simple, we don't even need substitution. All we have to remember is, what do I derive to get cosine theta? Well, that of course is sine theta. I guess in this case, alpha. Subbing in my limits of integrations, sine theta minus sine of negative theta, where we know that because the sine function is an odd function, sine of negative theta is just the same as negative sine theta. Minus a negative, that's plus, two goes away, and we end up with our final result, which is that. And then as a quick double check, you know, we can check that for q greater than zero, the e is in the negative j hat direction, which is what we expect due to the symmetry and also the direction and the moving away from the positive charge. So everything makes sense. And that's just a demonstration of how we deal with circular arcs.